Welcome everybody to our virtual town hall. A uh, special thank you to our ASL interpreter, Bobby McGee, for supporting today's event. I also want to welcome today's guests who will be sharing key updates and answering questions about uh, return to school. Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Keisha Scarlett, Chief of Student Support Services, Dr. Concy Pedroza, Director of Student Support Services, Carrie Nicholson, and Nathan Hale High School Principal, William Jackson. Last week, Seattle Public Schools and the Seattle Education Association came to a tentative agreement that supports a safe return to school buildings for 6th through 12th grade students starting April 19th. It will be brought to the SEA membership to be ratified and to the SPS Board of Directors for a vote this week. This agreement prioritizes continuity of learning for all 6th through 12th grade students and ensures that no matter the model that families select, most students will remain with their current classmates and teachers. I'm also happy to share that the agreement prioritizes social, emotional, and targeted intervention supports. Small group instruction, social emotional learning, and community building are intentionally built into the schedule. Today, we welcome back 6th through 12th grade special education intensive service pathway students and our kindergarten through 5th grade students. I visited Rainier View Elementary, MLK Junior Elementary, Rising Star Elementary and Dunlap Elementary Schools today. And I can tell you that it was awesome seeing our educators, our staff, our students and our families so excited. It gave me immense hope as we open our doors to all grades this month. While school will look different and it does, our staff have done an incredible job of creating safe and welcoming environments. It was really great to see our students learning routines already, um, learning about mask wearing, lining up six feet apart. They were out on the playground. Um, it was just a really awesome morning. And thank you to all the educators, students and families who were present um, learning um, all these new things that we have to do to be in buildings. Last week, um, sixth through 12th grade families received an enrollment survey and an opportunity to choose between hybrid in-person learning, part-time in-person and part-time remote, or to remain 100% remote. We ask that you complete the survey by Tuesday, April 6th, tomorrow at 11.59 p.m., right before midnight. We know that this is an important personal decision for families and students. We also recognize that this is a quick turnaround um, and apologize for um, that quick turnaround. Our goal today is to share key things that you may need to know as you make this decision and to answer your questions. As I've shared the governor's order to immediately bring back all 6th through 12th grade students by April 19th significantly impacted our timelines. We had been working in partnership with SEA to thoughtfully bring back students and staff safely. SPS is the largest district in the state and we are now working to respond as quickly and as nimbly as possible. Whether your student is returning to in-person or whether they're staying remote, our district is committed to providing a high quality learning environment. We're ready to support students' academic and social emotional needs. Throughout this transition, staff will help students get to know each other, discuss how students are feeling about changes, and lead with a sense of joy while providing individual support where needed. I'm going to now pass it over to Dr. Scarlett and Dr. Pedroza, who will share more information around schedules and what a day will look like for students returning in person. Again, thanks for being here and um, welcome everybody. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Dr. Keisha Scarlett, Chief Academic Officer. Superintendent Juno, thank you so much for having me here again today to share about our secondary 6 through 12 models. In our planning for secondary return to in-person instruction, our North, Star, our North Star value is racial equity. We work to ensure equitable access to high quality learning for three profiles of students and families. 
The first profile of students and families might be those most comfortable with in-person learning. Another profile are those um, most comfortable with remote learning but are starting to prepare their students for a transition back to in-person learning. And the third profile would be those families most comfortable with remote learning for their students, which can really provide families and students maximum flexibility and parent partnership. Keeping our joint values of racial equity and those students and family profiles in mind, we along with our labor partners from the Seattle Education Association have determined two instructional models for this spring for our students in grades 6 through 12th grade. One is a hybrid model that includes two and a half days of in-person instruction and a 100% remote instruction model. These instructional models will allow students to begin to transition to in-person learning while giving families the option for their students to remain in remote learning if that is where they feel most comfortable. We're surveying families now to gather input about how they would like their students to finish the remainder of the school year. Once we have the results of these surveys, we will develop cohorts for each school. It should be noted that cohorts at our middle school and high schools are different than from our elementary cohorts. For secondary students, this will mean that they will transition to different classes and will interact with at least three classes of students each per day. Students also stay with their current courses and current teachers. So for more elaboration on the secondary in-person models, students will be able to receive instructional supports throughout the day on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Each morning on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, all students will engage in remote live instruction in their current schedule classes. Periods one through three will be on Mondays and Thursdays, and periods four through five will be on Tuesdays and Fridays. In the afternoon on these same four days, students will have access to in-person and or remote small group support by their content area teachers. Afternoon instruction for differentiated instruction, sorry, afternoon um, instruction is for differentiated instruction and in individualized interventions. During afternoon instruction, students will engage in learning while supported by their content teacher. Students will be divided into three cohorts. Cohort A will have the opportunity to attend in person on Mondays and Tuesday afternoons and receive remote instructional support on each of the other days. Cohort B will have the opportunity to at attend in person on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons and receive instructional support on the other days. And cohort C will receive instructional support in the afternoons on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays fully remote. For example, the graphic shows students in cohort A. They will receive remote instruction in the morning on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays and then they will have the opportunity to come in person on Mondays and Tuesday afternoons for in-person instructional support. They will have remote instructional support on Thursdays and Friday afternoons. This is not considered a study hall approach, but rather a time for students to receive in instructional support from their content area teacher, the same teachers they interacted with remotely in the morning. A 45 minute break is also scheduled for lunch and transportation if necessary. From 11.10 a.m. to 11.55 a.m., in-person students may arrive on campus as early as 11.40 a.m. to do the daily health screening and find their classes. Afternoon classes will begin at 11.55 a.m. Remote learning will continue on Wednesdays for all students and will be focused on student and family check-ins, small group instruction, and individualized supports. Our students in grades 6 through 8 and K-8 schools will have a slightly different instructional model and bail time. K-8 schools have the option of providing in-person learning in the morning from 8 a.m. to 10.45 a.m. or in the afternoon from 11.45 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. depending on their survey data.
your student school will communicate their specific middle school schedule to you. K-8 school students will continue to receive four full days of instruction for all students and all students will have four half days of live remote instruction, Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays for all six through eight students from their current content teachers. Remote learning Wednesdays will continue for all students and will be focused on student and family check-ins and small group and individualized supports. For K-8 schools, an hour break is scheduled for lunch and transportation if necessary from 10.45 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. As with the K-5 return to in-person learning, we're working closely with our special education department to meet every student's individualized education plan and to promote inclusive classroom communities, which Dr. Pedroza will discuss in just a moment. In partnership with our student support services, we're also developing social emotional learning lessons for our educators to support students as they transition into the spring and in in-person learning. We know people have been at home for over a year. There will be a lot of feelings to address. We want to support students and staff as much as possible as we transition back to buildings, not just academically, but also with their social emotional needs. I know that this is a lot of information and there will be a lot of questions. We will try and answer as many as we can today. And with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Pedroza. Welcome, Dr. Pedroza. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, good evening, um, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Consi Pedroza, and I'm the Chief of Student Support Services. I'm glad to be here again. Um, I wanted to start by saying that we're very happy uh, to have welcomed back our families in all of our classrooms um, moving forward. Um, and this week, we started with 612 and intensive service pathways and buildings today. Um, we also want to acknowledge that um, families that may choose to stay remote for the rest of the year for whatever reason, um, it's also the right choice for many and we will continue to work with our families throughout this process. Um, just some information uh, to share, uh, 612 intensive service bell times are aligned to the general education peers who will return to school on April 19th. This includes resource and access pathways um, who also will start on Monday, April 19th. 612 intensive service pathways began today for secondary in the afternoons with some K-8s that had a morning cohorts aligned to their schedules. Uh, teachers were busy last week with training and planning for both remote and in-person instruction and students uh, with transportation in within their IEPs should have already been notified by the transportation department with routing information. If you haven't yet heard from the transportation department, please reach out to them directly. Um, finally, I just want to add a couple more things. IEP teams uh, may need to meet to determine if less, more, or different in-person services are needed for individual students. That includes access into general education courses. Uh, related services such as OT, occupational therapy, PT, physical therapy, and SLP, uh, speech, language, uh, patho uh, speech language therapy services will be served both remotely and in person, um, and they will communicate with families. 612 intent to enroll surveys went out to all families, all secondary families Friday night. They were translated in our top languages. The survey closes, um, as uh, Superintendent Juno said, 11.59 on Tuesday, April 6th. If you didn't get the survey, please check your spam or junk email boxes. However, school principals and administrative staff have a generic link to the survey, and that can be utilized uh, with your information. Please use the survey so that students can begin, I mean, for, for excuse me, please use the survey so that schools uh, can begin to plan for their cohort scheduling. Uh, schools will be doing additional outreach to families before and after the survey closes. Please contact your school if you did not get the survey and need that information. Um, it's very important that schools who uh, schools who schools know who's coming in. They need this to determine staffing and cohorts this week. We encourage everyone to take this survey within the window for planning purposes. 
Um, next week is spring break. There will be limited staff to assist, but schools will be able to follow up with individual families that didn't respond or those that said they needed more information. Once the survey closes, families can change their placement up until Friday, April 16th by contacting the school on or after Monday, April 19th. Um, they need to go through the formal appeals process, um, which is on the district website. Um, and I will now pass this on to Carrie Nicholson from Coordinated Health Team. Thank you, Dr. Pedroza. Um, I am going to just take a few moments here to share an overview of the health and safety protocols and provide some information specific to secondary students who are returning to in-person learning on April 19th. So to begin, Seattle Public Schools health and safety protocols reflect the recommendations set forth by the Department of Health and Public Health in Seattle and King County. These protocols include, but they're not limited to the following, wearing face coverings, maintaining six feet of distance, frequent hand washing, our daily house screening, and cleaning and disinfecting. Evidence continues to mount that students can safely return to in-person learning when these protocols are adhered to with fidelity. For the past several months, we've had some of our students with IEPs who've been receiving in-person services. And I'm pleased to share that we have not seen widespread transmission of COVID-19 within the district. This is a testament to our staff our students and their families who are following these protocols. Our way forward is with a continued commitment to adhering to the health and safety protocols across all grade levels. So while the protocols are gonna remain consistent across the district, there are a few nuances specific to secondary students that I wanna highlight. So the first pertains to daily health screening or attestation. Seattle Public Schools has launched an electronic attestation platform for families to complete their students health screening from home before the students arrive at school. Families with a student in 6th through 12th grade will have an opportunity to consent for their student to complete their own daily health screening. This decision is in alignment with Public Health Seattle and King County. Families will need to consent that their student understands the question and will answer the questions honestly before their student will be able to complete their own daily health screening. More information about this process will be shared out with families in the coming days. Secondly, there are some differences in how elementary and secondary students are grouped. Elementary students are assigned to a cohort which is, comp is comprised of approximately about 15 students. And as Dr. Scarlett noted, Secondary students will be returning to in-person in larger numbers and attend classes with their cohorts, either A or B, or those who remain in remote instruction as cohort C. So the question you might be asking is whether there's greater risk for transmission with this larger number of students. And the answer is no, as long as the health and safety protocols are followed. Students will be required to wear face coverings or masks, adhere to that six feet of physical distancing, and cleaning of desks and commonly touched surfaces will take place between classes. Another question that you might ask has to do with contact tracing. And what I want to assure you that the process for responding to a confirmed case of COVID will follow the existing protocols. The secondary model with more students will require more interviews, but the central COVID team will continue to work with public health and follow their recommendations pertaining to isolating and quarantining. Likewise, the district will continue following existing communication protocols for notifying families and staff of any impacts related to a confirmed case. And finally, I want to state that their mitigating measures to promote that six feet of physical distance will mean that students will not be using their lockers and they will not be dressing for PE. So in summary, there are some subtle differences that apply to secondary students. However, the health and safety protocols will remain constant across grade levels 
and across the district. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Principal Jackson. Good evening, SPS families and Superintendent Juno uh, for having me in this space. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, I have to share that today was really exciting because we had all of our students from our intensive service pathways in our school um, receiving learning and instruction, and it was really lively to see our students in the building. It was also nice to see all of our educators in the building who are receiving receiving trainings this week on uh, when, when we return on the 19th uh, for in-person learning and remote. So that was really exciting to get the energy back in our campus and to get that feeling back of uh, student learning um, in, in our school. Uh, this week, Monday through Wednesday, uh, we're focusing on trainings for our educators, primarily on building safety, um, school safety, and proper equipment, all of the specifics that have been mentioned by our, our other leaders just a moment ago. And this gives our students an opportunity to focus on the learnings that have been provided by the district or extra, extra learning opportunities that our teachers have provided. Families, students, and educators all want to know and feel that our in-person learning and our remote learning transition is done safely. And this is our responsibility as leaders to ensure that this transition is done properly. And we're really excited to do so, as you can see. Uh, two areas of safety that ta are taking primary focus are building safety and our social, emotional, and cultural safety. Within building safety, our, our focus truly is operationalizing all of this work that has been done over the past few weeks. Focus on our proper PPE, our proper protocols, remaining distant from our peers and our, our educators, making sure all students and educators are, are following um, the proper protocols as well. And with the social, emotional and cultural safety, ensuring that families, students and educators that we're centering their voice in any decisions that we're making, primarily our African-American males and our students furthest from educational justice. Um, we are committed to doing this, uh, even as a further example, we're working through our scheduling and what our actual schedule looks like when we return. And we're bringing in student voice. Tomorrow I meet with a student group. Uh, we meet with our educator group to ensure that we have our social emotional space. Uh, that is our advisory, we call it mentorship. Uh, and we're ensuring and committing that we're doing a great job as school leaders and educators through this process. Lastly, uh, quality instruction and the focus on providing high quality, culturally responsive teaching uh, for in-person and remote learning has been a question and a wonder. And we're excited to bring all of this back to families, especially to provide that security and safety to know that both in-person and remote will remain high quality, particularly for our families uh, furthest from educational justice. Um, we're excited to bring back our students. And when our students do come back, the students that do, do decide to come back, what it will look like uh, in the hallways. Um, I know some things won't be as normal as they have in the past. Uh, you won't be able to go to the water fountain. You'll have to grab a bottle of water and you'll be able to say hi to your peer, give an air hug. Uh, you'll be able to connect with your teacher uh, in person, um, distant, but you'll be able to say hi and I miss you. It's been a while. Uh, these are small things that we're excited to connect with our students in person and our families in person. Our educators are really excited about this because they've, as you, as you know, uh, we've been remote for a year. So excited to speak deeply about this uh, as we move on through this question and answer. But thank you again for having me here and we're working through this transition. Our educators are getting prepared um, and thank you. Principal Jackson, you get me excited for the return to school for 612. <laughs> Thank you for being out there and leading strong throughout all of this. I was, as I said, yeah. in our elementary schools this morning, and I know a lot yeah. of um, central administrators went out and saw what was happening, and it was great. I mean, yeah. it was, you know, our teachers were excited. Yeah. There were air hugs. There were air high fives coming yeah. in. Um, 
and students um, really seem to be excited to see people as they said in real life. Um, and so I guess one of the questions that came in is I saw some of the stuff that was on the ground at the elementary schools. So what will um, high schools, you know, for the students that are coming in for the very first time, I say, say your freshman students and they're coming into your high school for the very first time um, and really all of them coming into the building for the first time, what um, what does that look like as they step um, onto the campus? Well, there's this is something we're really excited about. Uh, our freshmen haven't had an opportunity to actually be inside of our campus. So it's our educators, our, our grade nine teachers and our admin team, even our counselors are extremely excited to meet them at the door um, because we have to teach our, all of our students what the entrance is and where they can actually enter our school and look, take a look at the arrows on the ground. This is a little bit different, but we're excited to connect with them right when they arrive. Part of that is the attestation process and um, that's some of the operations, but once they complete the attestation and they show up at the door, they will be greeted by by us, especially their first time coming to the building, uh, just like as we would do any time in the fall. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just it's, I think it's important for people to know that the adults in the building are going to be there and be prepared to lead you through the day and what your building looks like and um, sort of orient um, students to to the that process. And um, there was a question that came in about how will t a teacher manage both hybrid and in-person teaching? Um, and are they doing it at the same time? And what's that look like? So we're leveraging the technology that we have um, for our students, both um, for remote learning and in-person learning. And also teachers have technology. They have a presentation station. They also have their laptops. So using um, some of the um, instructional technology that we have, um, we're really helping to support our teachers to engage um, with both um, our in-person students and those students learning remotely. Um, so there are a variety of different ways um, and we're still learning more from our instructional technologists. I know there was a question that came up about like um, what might um, a lesson look like for biology. So I'll just go ahead and, um, and elaborate on that right now. So um, for instance, so in the morning, let's say that you have a biology lesson and then in the afternoon you came to that same teacher. So in the morning, maybe the teacher gave the students an exit ticket, like a little assessment to help them to understand better about the content that students were able to take up and to make plans for what a small group instruction would look like. So in the afternoon, students would come. They'd also be joined with students who are learning remotely in the afternoon. Um, and a teacher would get on Teams and they might give students some type of task um, from the morning that they're working on, a group of those students, and do, then do small group instruction with students whose exit ticket demonstrated that they needed another run through um, sale, my or something like that um, within that um, within that time span and then they're able to actually rotate in between different groups of students that are working on um, different um, assignments and also provide the individualized instruction right through teams so that's the plan um, one plan but we also want to maximize some of the capacities that our um, educators have actually developed during remote learning and give maximum flexibility for them to be able to engage with their students in the ways that they instructionally um, see fit Great, and so I guess I just really want to make it clear that um, this agreement, you know, was uh, the negotiating teams on, on both SCI and SPS came to this conclusion, and I just want to make it really clear that it is not a study hall. There's a lot of um, talk out there on social media and all that, and even though, you know, it is, it looks different. I mean, we are still in pandemic learning. There's still a, you know, things are still happening and so I just want to make sure that people understand that it is not a study hall that we're asking students to click in person back that they are with their content teachers and that instruction will be happening and so um, again just thanks for all of that that hard work that went into that. Um, there's a question about is there a vaccination requirement for the staff and other adults in the buildings and so Carrie maybe you can tell us a little bit about vaccinations. Uh, we've been, we've had, I guess the one thing we should say is we've had some great partners who've helped us set aside um, vaccinations for our SPS staff. And so thank you to everybody who chipped in on that. Yeah, it, it's been, it's been wonderful and nurses stepping in and helping get staff vaccinated. So very much appreciate the partnership. 
As far as vaccine requirement goes, there is not a vaccine requirement with COVID um, for staff or for students at this time. Um, it's a personal decision. Um, and so there is not a requirement um, for, for staff or students in returning to in-person. Okay. Um, and then there's a question about whether students will have the same three teachers in the afternoons as their morning classes. And so maybe just a little more discussion about what that split looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, they will all participate in the launch of the lesson in the morning and then get small group individualized instructional support from the same teacher in the afternoon. So you will remain. So if you have biology and art and um, mathematics, first, second and third period, you'll see those same um, teachers in the afternoon um, for a small group in individualized support and instruction um, on those days. OK, and then I know that while we were in the middle of negotiations and all this, CDC sort of changed their guidance. Um, and I think that's also an important point to, to talk about is that every time, you know, we've had to be super nimble, even as a very large organization, when CDC changes guidelines or Department of Health changes guidelines or labor and industry change their rules, that we had to adjust to all of that. And so, you know, because we were the messengers, often it appeared messy or uncoordinated, but know that we were also being very nimble and flexible given the changing structure of how this pandemic rolled out. And so again, just a huge lift by so many staff members, um, both at Central and across the district that, um, you know, that we're actually to this point and, and this exciting point. But Carrie, there's a question that, you know, even while we were in the midst of all this, CDC changed its guidelines from six feet to three feet. And so can you talk a little bit, or Keisha, or one of you, about why we're not moving to three feet um, and st sticking with the six feet? Yeah, I'm happy to um, talk a little bit about that. So while we were hearing about it, we've been proactive in reaching out to find out as soon as we could and, and anticipating that this might come. So the easy answer is that operationally, right, a lot of time and commitment has gone in and in the measuring and, and maintaining that six feet of distance, not only in the classroom, but in movement throughout the building. So lots of thought and work behind that. As far as contact tracing goes, and I don't know how much this has been lifted up, but I just want to make listeners aware that contact tracing um, is still six feet. So you are a close contact if you're within that six feet for greater than 15 minutes. So for us in maintaining the six feet rule um, will help us in that contact tracing where um, students and or staff or both will not be identified um, for the most part as being close contacts as long as we adhere to those protocols. So I think that's a, an important point um, to highlight here that I think that it might behoove us as we finally get back into school, which is so exciting for to hear today. Um, that this will allow us with that six foot rule to continue and not have those close contacts identified. And then Dr. Pedroza, there's just a question about IEP timelines and when will um, when will um, we know if IEP determines if a student needs more support? So that can happen now. Um, as soon as students come in, um, we would, would like the, to give some time for the, the school staff to actually have uh, time to get uh, uh, used to the new scheduling and timelines, but uh, an IEP team meeting can be called at any time uh, throughout the year on any day, as long as they notify their case manager and they want to talk about either. And sometimes there might be a decision to move a student into um, a general education classroom or uh, do less, but currently it's four days a week. Um, so those IEP teams could make those decisions and families are always part of that process. And then just a question about the survey. I know we all know it's out and again, 11.59 p.m. tomorrow is when it's due on Tuesday, April 6th. Um, and I guess uh, when, what's sort of the timeline after that, Dr. Pedroza, as far as when will parents and families know whether the student goes Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, like what, what's happening after 11.59 tomorrow? Yes, so that's going to be a big effort by everybody. Um, so we real I know there's a lot of people that are sort of like I need more information and and there's also people that probably aren't 
filling out the survey because it does say on the survey that any uh, people who respond they don't know it defaults to remote learning and those are all true. Um, the schools and um, principals are actually working really hard uh, to make sure that they do some outreach to families. It's important that they know if you are interested in in person, please indicate that you're interested in in person. Um, if you're not, if you don't want, have no interest, then that's fine. But if you you're kind of 90% there, uh, at least indicate on the survey yes, and then we can work through appeals process after the start. Schools really need to know that information. So what happens is after it closes, then we have to gather all of that data and information, and then we have to share it with the school teams. The school teams are going to then do the outreach to some, especially families that they probably have already worked with and thought, huh, we know that this family was interested in in-person, but they didn't respond in person on the survey or maybe a family that maybe it's a language barrier and so they they might have instructional assistance to help and assist with that and so we want to make sure that the schools have adequate time at the end of this week to really reach out to those hard to reach families um, and so that they can have all of that data to do the planning um, it'll be open uh, up until next week during spring break and um, but on April 19th, we're going to close the survey down and then it'll be an enrollment process after that so schools can work through that process. But uh, we would like to make sure that at least by the end of this week, the school teams have the majority of their students uh, and 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 their and that are coming in into into in person so that they can really focus on the ones that um, they know might be interested in coming in person or maybe didn't get an opportunity to respond to the survey. Um, so I hope that answered your question, Superintendent Gino. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess I'm going to just, I, this has been great, and I know that there are so many, so many, so many more questions out there, and this is really, it's difficult. It, it is, um, you know, it, it's always a moving target, and, you know, we want to figure this out alongside of our community, um, and so also know that in this time and space that a family cannot make a wrong decision. They can only make a decision for that suits them. You know, whether you choose 100% remote, whether you choose to come back um, in person for um, the instructional model that uh, is going to be provided, that that is, you know, it's a personal choice. And so know that there is no wrong choice choice in this setting. Um, but, um, you know, Principal Jackson, I kind of want to pass it off to you. Uh, I'll wrap up at, after you, but it's, um, you know, in as we've been through this for an entire year now, a little over a year, like what's your what's your advice to students at this moment um, of either coming back in person or staying remote? And, and like, what's the message that we want to make sure we, you know, we've worked through this and want to make sure that we keep students at the center of everything. So tell me what's your advice to students and um, how things have been, uh, yeah, you know, from your perspective. Sure, uh, we thanks for asking and we are working extremely hard as educators to ensure that both options are high quality for you. We miss you and we want to see you in person and we want to connect with you. So I would love for you all to fill out the survey and come to school in person. However, uh, we are going to provide a high quality instruction and love you up in in person or remotely. Uh, it, either choice. There is no wrong choice here. Yep. Yeah, and I would just ditto that. We we cannot wait to see you. I mean, today it was great being out in schools and again, people very excited and um, just knowing how hard our school leaders have been working to get our school buildings ready um, and to get all the processes and protocols in place has been a huge lift. And so we're all looking forward to seeing our sixth through 12th grade students, um, those who chose to come back, back in buildings as well. But just really wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Our goal for today's event was to um, talk about grades six through 12 and help families make a more informed decision on returning to in-person or whether to remain remote. Um, if there are questions that we did not get to today, and I know that there are a lot, we'll work to respond to them in the comments. Um, and also, you can also reach out to us through Let's Talk by going to seattleschools.org and clicking the orange contact central office button. And the appropriate staff person will work to get back to you as soon as possible. But again, thanks to all our panelists today. Um, these are the experts in their field. Um, and, you know, again, um, it was great to see students in person. Can't wait to see the rest of you on the 19th. And so happy spring break, everybody.